Um, I, I was a young executive at Avco Embassy Pictures, and our company was working with a company in New York, and I was liaising with a woman named Carol Olson. And she said, that there's a young filmmaker in New York who's just made this short, Dracula Bites the Big Apple, you, you gotta meet this guy. And so I met him, and I asked him uh, if, if he wanted to do something, and what we thought we might do is get a development deal with her company, because <laughs> they had a lot of money. And so uh, together we knocked our heads, and Richard wrote uh, an idea that, that I participated in called, It Came, dot, 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 all night. And uh, it, was a, a, it was supposed to be a, a, a spoof because Airplane had just made a lot of money spoofing off the thriller genre. So we thought we might do the same with, with horror. And uh, we really couldn't sell that idea. Everybody said, you know, um, it's not, the wisdom at the time, for, for, take it for what you will, is it, you can't make a funny film and have scary things in it you can take a scary film and have funny things in it. And Reanimator kind of defined that at the time. You see something funny? I think this is serious. Reanimator, uh, if you will, defined uh, comedy inside of, a, of the horror genre in, in the 80s. And so uh, our, our take was if, if we were going to make a movie, it should, it should, we should do something scary. It might be a quick start for us. I liked producing. I had been producing. Richard wanted to write and produce. I believed in that, and uh, I believe in him. I still do, always have. Uh, very talented man. Um, ask, I ask him for advice on a continuing basis. Um, we went horror. Uh, I thought of the title. It just struck me one day. I had a long drive home every night from work, and I thought, vampires, vamp, stripper, vampires, and it just, it, I just saw the title. Vamp. It, it just it rang like a bell to me, and I said, "That's going to be our movie. It's going to be called Vamp, Stripper Vampires." I I had just had the same challenge with Angel, a high school honor student by day, Hollywood hooker by night. That the studio actually asked me to make it sleazy at low end. I just just couldn't do it. I don't know how. I, it's I'm a goofball at the end of the day, and, and I find comedy everywhere. Uh, um, you know, I, 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 I put the transvestite in, in Angel because I thought it was funny. You know, I, I made the, 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 the manager a, a, a lesbian. Um, it, with Vamp, it just struck me, stripper vampires, and, and Richard immediately had a take of um, two buddies, where one was fast talking and the other was cautious. And I thought that's, that's a great dynamic to put in, in there. You're going to have a big party tonight, right? And for this party, you're definitely gonna need party stuff. Stuff. What, you're gonna need booze? Booze. You're gonna need tunes? Tunes. You're gonna need entertainment. Booze is easy. We provide it. Anything at all, anything you need, and we're in. I had a good take on the, the comedic sidekick. I, a lot of the one-liners that he had, I enjoyed using as, as bad jokes in my life. And um, it, it was a fun thing to put together. Say, babe, what time do you get off? 2.30. Can I watch? <laughs> One of my favorite horror films of all time is Bedazzled with Peter Cook and Dudley Moore. And I mean, I, I must have seen that a hundred times before I ever sat down with Vamp. And for me, that's what you want to do, is you want to be Peter Cook and Dudley Moore when you're making a horror film. It, it's, it's, it entertains me more. <laughs> you're ready to die for me, aren't you? You would. Because you can't believe that I'm not me anymore. That maybe there's something left, huh? I'm a, a voting member of the Academy, and so I was watching the Academy Awards, and he picked up the trophy for Cocoon, and I said, that's the guy for me. <laughs> he, he had just won the Academy Award for Best Special Effects Makeup, and I wanted the best person alive. Last stop. I don't need this ah. shit. We had the most fantastic casting director that ever walked the face of the earth, the late Linda Francis. And we were making a play to have the name in the movie be Jerry Lewis, because Richard wrote the part for Jerry Lewis, it was perfect for Jerry Lewis. Sandy Barron ended up getting the part. We got it to Jerry Lewis. He loved the script, he wanted to do it. Some Yahoo in the sales department deemed that the film would only work in France 
if it had Jerry Lewis in it. Because he had a crystal ball and he could see the future and he knew everything. And he had a job and they listened to him. And this Yahoo pretty much killed our dream. Hey, nobody's perfect. Okay, best I can with what I got. And then they got the idea though that since they were excited that our film, which was already green lit now, could afford a name, that we had to have a name in the movie. So we couldn't think of another name like Jerry Lewis, so we decided to go the other way with a vampire. So our, our casting director, Linda Francis, made this long list of names. And somebody in the foreign sales department that was a different Yahoo had, had seen that Grace Jones' name was on the list, and this time she has exactly two credits, Conan and A View to a Kill. Well, when you're in foreign sales, you sell by association. So here's our little $3.3 million movie with the star of $33.3 million movies. Well, that, that, that was a big, big deal to the sales department. A huge deal that for, for them, it, it wasn't that there's a guy named James Bond in James Bond movies. You know, it was gonna be, we got the star of James Bond, Grace Jones. That's how they were gonna position the film. And, and then they had to have her at that point. And there was, it became an Inside New World. It was the Grace Jones project. Um, it, it was fine. It got our movie uh, more profiled. What you come to realize in distribution is, no matter what the size of a distributor, they can really only get behind about one movie every three months. So we were their summer picture and they were behind us and we had the full resources of the studio and that was appreciated. I love Manhattan. I go there all the time. I mean, I was at the clubs where she was getting handcuffed there. That's why I thought to, to, to get, um, you know, D David Spada and, uh, and Keith Haring involved because they, the, they were the two guys that followed her around and made her nightclub famous in New York. Um, but I, I, I didn't get what the foreign people got from the James Bond movie and from the Conan movie. And once they explained it to me, I really got it because our foreign sales were through the roof. We went through the process that you go through. We have a director, we have a head of, of special makeup effects. He creates his design ideas in, in first in a meeting with Richard, and then he goes away and, and starts to then realize them and then receives additional direction from the director. And, and it, it's a process. What you might be interested to know about this process was involving Grace Jones on her first day she required in her contract a, a driver, pick her up, bring her to Greg Canham. His, his, his uh, working at the time out of his own home, which kind of looks like your grandmother's house, little doilies on the couch and everything. It's really polite little uh, living room. Takes her face masks and I get a phone call the next morning. Greg likes to know where, where Grace Jones is. Uh, cell phones weren't invented in <laughs> 1986. Um, where's Grace Jones? Where's Grace? I don't know. I'm calling the hotel, calling the driver. No, nobody can find Grace Jones. She's in, she's in Paris. Um, <laughs> uh, I, the, the designer, uh, the, the French designer, Azadine, uh, Leia, I think it is, he, he, he provided the gowns for the end sequence in the movie that she used. He calls and apologizes and said, I'm having my new fashion runway show. Grace had to be here. You, I knew you wouldn't mind said, this is me, I mind. Grace, get her back on the plane, get her back here. Uh, we then put a 24-hour PA one with her with a pager so we'd always know where she was at. And to make up for it, he sent triples of, of a dress that he sewed by hand that we used in our final sequence that would have cost our production $100,000. I mean, the man was a prince and he, and, he, and he paid it. But we learned quickly when we're working with Grace and designing makeup effects that, um, you know, <laughs> Somebody gives her a couple tickets to Paris, she's gonna just jump on that next plane. <laughs> Cause she did. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, I was wondering, maybe later tonight, if you're interested in doing a little encore performance for a much more appreciative audience, I could definitely make it worth your while. We were given uh, approximately $3.3 million to make this film by New World Pictures. And uh, Richard and I were quite ambitious. We wanted the film to be much more than most people could do with that kind of money, and we really reached for it. 
there was a, a, a completion guarantor on the film, and uh, we had a very difficult time making the schedule uh, for two reasons. The, 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 well, three reasons. The, the, the first, weather. We had really bad weather. It rained a lot on our exterior night locations. Um, and the second reason was uh, Grace Jones' ability to uh, appear on time. <laughs> Um, I, I actually went to the point after she disappeared to Paris in pre-production to pay a young woman 24 hours a day to always have Grace in her She would sleep outside Grace's door in the hall. She would follow her to work, uh, separate showers, and then, and, and she loved the job. She was a Grace Jones fan and, and they, they got on famously. Um, but it was hard just to find Grace Jones. And one day in particular, the completion Bond rep was on the set and Grace was about two hours late. And, 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 and I said, what, what can we do? We're just waiting for Grace. He said, well, I, I expect you to, to get her. I, I'm the producer of the film. You, you want me to go that, wake Grace up? I said, here's the keys to her house. He says, you have the keys to her house? I said, I, I've got a 24 hour PA on her. We've got a driver. That's our cook in there. It's, 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 if you want to come to dinner tonight, Timothy Leary is going to be in the van with Barbara. Okay. It's, it's, it, I know how the set's working, but you can't move Grace faster than she moves. And because she's playing a vampire, she's become nocturnal for the movie. It's, it's, we're shooting interior sets at night because she's in character. It's, it's crazy stuff is going on. So he says, okay. And he takes the keys and he goes up to the house. He finds her in bed with one of the actors in the movie and his brother <laughs> and Victoria Sellers, who's currently on the FBI number one wanted list for a drug cocaine bust in New Jersey six days before. And so now I'm negotiating a detente, turning Victoria Sellers into the FBI, uh, trying to get Grace to apologize. Oh, and Grace throws a lamp and hits the guy from the bond company. <laughs> it, it, it's it, you know, like a oh, day in the life of our movie. The third reason that, that we were having problems on the show was because I couldn't get anybody to build the sets for our budget. And one guy comes to me with, uh, I'll do the sets, he's a startup company. But what he does is he takes the 50% deposit that you give up front and he actually spends it all on capital goods. So his, he's buying his hammers, he's, he's buying his truck, he's buying the... So he spent all the money now and he hasn't bought any of the expendable goods, you know, the wood to build our sets, <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the people, the carpenters to hammer the wood. So we've got this big mess now with the set that started construction and stopped. And there's all these really nice new tools there. <laughs> and, and that really put us behind schedule while we sorted out that mess. Builder of major erections. Our construction engineer, Hard Addington. Come on, let's hear it. I had a very successful career. This was my fifth picture. I, I had already had uh, the fortune of making the number one pictures for New World Pictures the last two years. I had their, their hits Angel, Children of the Corn, and Tough Turf, um, and their critical success, Crimes of Passion. Uh, this was their, their number one film in 86. It did about $11 million at the box office. It's funny, as, as I was buying films at Avco Embassy Pictures, we looked at a, a Canadian film, Terror Train, and Paramount was in the other room bidding on it. And we wrote down our numbers that we thought it could do about $8 million. They wrote down their numbers, they thought it could do about $8 million. Based on that, they passed and we bought it. Um, it, it we were a small company, that was a big number for us. VAMP did $11 million. That was a really big number for us, uh, really big. Um, overseas, it, it, it made its money back. And then again in video, it made its money back. And then again in TV, it made its money back. It made its money back several times over and, and was their biggest box office success that year. We, we came up against the uh, second uh, alien picture, Aliens, um, and they owned the market that weekend. And uh, the distributor admitted that that being a scary movie with a significant budget and ours being a scary movie with a slight budget that they they really should not have gone head to head with that they should have counter programmed it in a weekend against comedy or or action or something not against straight up horror corman sold out uh 
the company to uh, uh, Harry Evans Sloan, Larry Cuppin, and Larry Thompson in 1982. And uh, about a month after uh, he was completely gone, I, I took over as head of production for New World. I did that for one year. And literally, we had to order chairs, desks, um, I had to build forms. And this is all before personal computers, so that involves bringing printers in and getting these T rulers out and making lines. And you, Corman took everything with him when he left. Um, and uh, this was the, the fifth picture that, that I made under my independent producing contract. Um, I started my own company, Planet Productions, in 1984, and this was our fifth production. You're doing well, you know that. Bear with me here. Uh, Robert Kurtzman is a, a, a good friend of mine, um, now with P13, founder of KNB, and uh, he called me up one day and said that he and Quentin Tarantino um, had viewed Vamp and uh, were inspired and wrote a script called From Dusk Till Dawn, and would I read it and produce it? I said, happy to read it. I read it, and I went, well, I, I kind of feel like I already made this movie. And he said, that's why we called you. We don't want to get sued. And I said, okay, fair enough, because I'm the rights holder still on the project. I love the show, girls. It's brilliant. Very tastefully done. Come on. I think we did a lot better job of explaining how uh, a place like this could be credible, where they just went for the pure comic book fantasy of it. You know, that in a world that doesn't exist, here's a place that could never exist, and, and here's what happens. I think. Once they made it happen, they delivered the genre of uh, exploding heads and uh, um, real carnage. Um, and, and, and there's a core market for that, which, which Bob Kurtzman loves. Um, we didn't go for that market. They, they, they own that market. We didn't even try and get in there. Um, I, uh, this isn't exactly the time I had in mind. I thought maybe you... <laughs> And so um, I said I'd be happy to produce it. I made one phone call um, to the people I made Leprechaun 2 for, Trimark, and uh, they said, oh, we'll, we'll make this movie. And we had a production deal that fast. Well, um, Tarantino's representatives are nobody's fools. Based on me setting the deal up they, that fast, they went and checked the temperature around town and found a much better deal than I, than I found. And so um, Bob called me up and said, I'm in a funny position here because I have a better deal to take this project to uh, over at, uh, I guess it would be Miramax Dimension. And uh, he says, but, but you've already got us set up there. He says, I'll, here, I'll make you a deal. If you give me the rights back, I'll, I'll make a movie for you for free. I said, okay. And so he did, and we made The Demolitionist then, um, which he then wrote and directed uh, with Nicole Agard for me. And he threw in all the effects and um, the man of his word. I, I think uh, he got the better end of the finance on it, but <laughs> he kept his word. <laughs> It'll be a pleasure helping you guys out. Can I call you guys? <laughs> Great. The world evolves. Um, to go to a strip club, when we made Vamp, it, it was uh, something where you, you could kill the guy in the next booth and nobody would notice. People had their head. Now you see the paparazzi standing in front of the strip club taking a picture, Ashton Kutcher and Demi Moore walking out of it. it it's a proud moment in life. So I think what, what we do is necessarily play into that, that if, if there are vampires who are strippers in today's world, how upscale is up? <laughs>